Warning, this video contains a doctor's rant and explanation of the various pros and cons concerning many of today's most popular diets, including keto, carnivore, vegetarian, and vegan. This series is low in production and high in value. Enjoy. Hey there, my name is Dr. Anthony Balduzzi, and I believe this is going to be one of the most important videos that um, I've ever shot. And in this video, I want to talk a little bit about the truth behind nutrition um, and what humans should eat, and also why the discussion around this is so complicated these days. So the Game Changers documentary just came out. Now a lot of people are bringing up a lot of questions about plant-based nutrition, going vegan, vegetarian, uh, the pros of that, and potentially that might be this like panacea kind of diet for helping both ourselves and the planet. And on the flip side of the equation, we have carnivores. People are now going to these all meat diets and they seem to be having uh, really great results. And now we have this huge clash war and maybe paleo somewhere in here and then keto's over here. And this is this confusing landscape. Um, and I think for most of us as people who want to one, eat the right things, two, feel great, three, look great, uh, you know, we're finding ourselves either in one of these camps and staunchly behind our positions, or uh, we're somewhere in the middle and we're confused about what we should eat and what the truth is. Now, I've been studying nutrition for almost 25 years now, um, and I want to quickly introduce myself and a little bit of my background before we dive into this big conversation. Um, you know, I basically grew up watching my own dad get very sick, lose his health, and he passed away at 42 years young. I was nine at the time um, and it completely rocked my world. I remember um, just thinking to myself that I wanna do everything that I could to be strong and healthy to take care of my mom, my little brother. Um, and that's what really sparked my initial passion into nutrition and exercise. And around my 10th birthday is when I started cleaning up my eating, uh, you know, eating more vegetables and exercising more. And I had no idea what I was doing at the time, but it started the cycle that would progress over the next 20 years of obsessing over the concepts of what does the human body need to thrive on this planet to maintain the health. Um, and I've been everywhere from um, some of the world's most competitive bodybuilding stages to what I do now. Um, with the Fit Father Project and the Fit Mother Project, our two companies where we help moms and dads around the world get healthy. We've helped over 20,000 men and women lose well over 150,000 pounds um, in over 100 different countries. So uh, amazing stuff there. Now, that's not the point of this discussion. The point is to get into some of this philosophy. And I want to start um, the discussion by actually looking at the carnivore diet, which is one of the uh, biggest popular you know, surging things. We're also going to talk about keto. Um, in general. Now, I'm going to kickstart this part one with the carnivore diet, but I promise you over the course of this series, um, I want to analyze a lot of these topics, the stuff that I know about this, um, link you to some relevant research, pull in a lot of the conflicting arguments. So let's get started. So the carnivore diet, this is where a lot of people now are uh, basing their entire diets off of only animal products. So um, this is honestly kind of like a sect of the ketogenic camp, which is like, let's really lower our carbohydrates. Let's get our bodies fat adapted. Let's run our brains off of ketones and let's stay away from all the sugar and the carbs that are messing so many people up. Carnivores took it to the next thing. And there's like in this subset of very low carb diets, we're only going to get our, our, our calories from animal products. And here's the thing. A lot of people are doing this and they're seeing great results. I think there's a Dr. Sean Baker, who's a main proponent of this. And there's lots of anecdotes of people, particularly with autoimmune conditions, meaning conditions where the body's own immune system is hyperreactive and is in attacking joints. It's attacking, uh, and that might be some kind of arthritis. If it's attacking some of your nerves, this could be like a multiple sclerosis. If it's attacking your digestive tract, this could be um, inflammatory bowel diseases like Crohn's and ulcerative colitis. So all these autoimmune conditions, people are seeing those clear up on carnivore diets. Um, and that's one big benefit. We're going to talk about why in just a second. And I actually want to uh, spend a little bit defending the carnivore diet and some of the good things before we're going to make the transition over and see what are some of the problems with this diet and why are there people in this other camp, the vegan, vegetarian, plant-based lifestyle that think these people over here are crazy. So first off, um, carnivore diet, uh, what we're not getting when we're getting the carnivore diet is we're staying completely away from all the processed crappy carbs that trip so many people up, people who are eating only meat. Um, or fish, or, uh, you know, like fish, seafood, meat, you know, organ meats, these kind of things are staying away from all the processed refined sugars, the high fructose corn syrup. Um, they're also staying away from certain plant foods, which if you don't know, uh, plants can cause problems for humans. So plants don't, like all biological life, don't necessarily want to be eaten. Uh, so what they do is they produce natural pesticides and natural neurotoxins to keep bugs away. And we know it's, this is so crazy that plants are doing this dynamically. We think of that tomato 
tomatoes that's sitting on the tree is something that's dead, but it's not. It's completely alive. And what we know is that if the tomato is being eaten by the caterpillar on one side, it will produce more lectins and neurotoxins on the other side of the fruit so that it makes that caterpillar sick and it gets a chance to survive and reproduce like everything. So, well, it turns out that there are certain subsets of plants that uh, plants and legumes, I would say, in these classes of plant-based foods that produce toxins that are harmful to human health and they don't want to be eaten. So there are a lot of beans that if you eat in their raw state, they contain these kind of lectin lectins like hemagglutinin that could potentially even kill you. And there are people with certain genetic deficiencies like G6PD, uh, where your blood cells are not producing um, you know, enough of these really essential metabolites. And if you eat things like fava beans, it can absolutely kill you. So plants are not all safe. And this is why you need to be selective about the current kind of plant foods. And here's the thing too, I can't just hand you a list and say, hey, here are the most problematic plants. You know, things like nightshades, like your tomatoes and your uh, onion, or I'm sorry, tomatoes and bell peppers and stuff like that, or beans that aren't properly processed or X, Y, Z. It's also individual. So plants that might uh, be of harmful to you, they might not affect me and, and vice versa. This is why it's so important as early on in our lives as we can is to figure out the subset of foods that make our bodies feel good. Because so many people make the mistake of, of chronically eating these low-level inflammatory foods, and that's unique to your immune system. So you might be thinking, okay, Dr. Anthony, what about these food allergy tests? Should I just go get one of those done and get my IgG allergies tested to see um, if I have problems with any of these you know, plant foods? And I promise you in this rant, we're going to work our way back to carnivore through this. Um, and I would say, you know, we don't, we think those tests aren't actually as reliable. Um, and the best thing you can probably do is go on a very clean diet, an elimination diet, get the system clean, get rid of all the main allergens, the dairy, uh, the wheat, the corn, the soy, these main things that trip most people up. And then we can reintroduce foods and see how your body reacts once you're clean. This is why fasting is very healing. This is why juice fasting, particularly for periods of time, can really clean and reset your body. The point being, we want to figure out those food allergies, elimination diets are best. So, Back to carnivore diet, what's essentially happening here is we're having a very clean elimination diet. Yes, there might be some problems with meat, and I'm going to talk about it in just a second, but certainly it's avoiding this whole host of problems over here. Um, a lot of these plant foods that are inflammatory, gone. So this is why people on all meat carnivore diets may not be even eating green leafy vegetables, like no spinach whatsoever, because um, they're keeping it totally clean. And we'll, we can even dive into so much minutia. If you want me to talk about the oxalates and some of these foods and other issues, you can comment below and we can continue the momentum of this discussion. I want to stay big picture philosophy here. So elimination diet with the carnivore diet, um, obviously leading to lower immune reactivity. People are healing their autoimmune diseases. They feel great. Um, so that's maybe a thumbs up. Another, another criticism of the carnivore diet is like, hey, well, what about the whole vitamin C thing? You know, we heard about that thing scurvy that the pirates would get back in the day. You know, this is essentially based on the fact that our body needs vitamin C to help produce collagen. Um, in, you know, there's a metabolic pathway. Collagen is the most abundant protein. Uh, you know, it makes up our hair, our skin, our nails. And what happens if we don't get vitamin C, we're not making enough collagen, you get scurvy. And scurvy is essentially a breakdown of connective tissue. You're bleeding out of your gums uh, and your body's not healing as fast and ultimately it could lead to death. Well, it turns out what are the most vitamin C rich foods? When I say vitamin C, you probably think of things like oranges and citrus fruits and limes and lemons. And maybe even if you know your nutrition, you might be thinking some dark leaf green, dark leafy greens can have a lot of vitamin C in them. And that's all true. We don't typically think of animal based foods. And I, I don't know off the top of my head, I'm going to say the recommended daily intake or allowance for vitamin C is roughly around 60 milligrams. So not very much. Certainly your needs can be fulfilled by maybe even one piece of certain kinds of fruits or a cup of certain kind of veggies. Um, but what about meat? Like if we're not getting the vitamin C, which we cannot make on our own, it's an essential nutrient, a vitamin we need to consume um, because we can't make it internally. If we're not getting this here, are we going to see scurvy in carnivores? Well, it turns out it's not really propping up. People have been on these diets for a long time. I think there are a couple of case studies uh, of people who have gotten scurvy, but they're few and far between. Most people do fine on their vitamin C, uh, you know, status on carnivore diets. Why? Because fresh meats themselves do contain vitamin C in them in small amounts. But when, listen, when you're not doing normal carbohydrate metabolism, you don't need as much vitamin C to drive forward a lot of these reactions. There's also some evidence that glucose, sugar, and vitamin C compete with each other at transports for uptake. So if you get rid of all the glucose over here, the vitamin C needs are also lower. So carnivores, they can get their vitamin C in very trace amounts from, you know, some muscle meats, although if you cook it, it can degrade some of the vitamin C, certainly organ meats. So were I to go follow a carnivore diet, 
which I'm not, and I'll tell you what my diet is throughout the course of the series. But if I were to, I would definitely be doing lots of organ meats and you wanna make sure you're getting enough collagen on that diet, the connective tissue, the glycine as a key amino acid um, to really help fuel the healing of benefits of this potential diet. Um, so to get to the point of it is vitamin C, you can get it from uh, animal meats, but they have to be fresh and they have to be of good quality. So let's talk about the freshness first. The longer something, you know, sits out and, and, you know, so if you go to some of these supermarkets, a lot of people don't know, they actually spray the meats and include certain kinds of chemicals in the meats. Now there are different laws and regulations based on certain places. So, you know, correct me if I'm wrong, maybe your state or your local supermarket doesn't do this, but they can actually use things um, to prevent the iron in the meat, the heme iron from rusting. When that steak is sitting there at the, you know, the deli counter and starts to turn brown, that is the heme iron inside the steak literally getting oxidized, rusting. And so they can do things to spray on them to make them fresh. So the problem is, what if you're doing a carnivore diet, but you're eating old meat? Well, the older meat degrades the vitamin C status um, and might actually have some more oxidation that goes through here and is probably going to be a lot less healthy than if you actually had fresh, high quality meat. So if you go carnivore, the quality of your food matters immensely. And we don't need to just worry about how fresh it is, which fresh meats would be good, good to get on carnivore. You also have to worry about what that animal ate. And this is the omnivore's dilemma. Um, you know, a, certainly a big part of it to, to quote the Michael Pollan book title, um, is that we have to worry and be very conscious as we eat further up the food chain. Humans high on the food chain, so are lions, so are sharks, so are other things. So the higher up we eat on the food chain, we have to worry about what those organisms ate. That's why there's a big difference between a grass-fed beef and corn-fed beef. They have different levels of fats, more omega-3s, more CLA in the grass-fed versus more omega-6 from the corn that the beef was fed. Omega-6 can be pro-inflammatory if you have too much of this. Standard American diet, and I'm sure standard European diet or Asian diet, if you're watching this over there, um, is very high in those omega-6s. That's pro-inflammatory. So big difference there. So we need to make sure that we're eating the, the stuff of the highest quality. And listen, we're completely leaving off um, for the purposes of keeping this discussion focused on nutrition and biochemistry and what to actually eat. We're leaving off the ethics issues, which I'm not saying by leaving them off um, you know, that they're unimportant because they think the ethics of both how sustainable it is to raise the amount of big agriculture is a discussion that needs to be had. And it's absolutely essential. I'm passionate about it. But for the purposes of even be able to move forward with um, a remotely on topic specific rant conversation, we can't, we have to leave that off or we'd get stuck right there at that particular spot. Um, so point being carnivore, need fresh meat. You can ve meet your vitamin C levels. You're getting rid of all the stuff that's really stimulating, uh, your immune system. Um, and you know, we have to, but you do have to be very wary of what your food ate. So a pasture raised egg is a lot better than a regular one. That egg yolk should be orange. Your steak should be grass fed. Your seafood should be uh, lower in mercury. So I wouldn't go eat a bunch of like a tuna with a lot of methyl mercury. I'd maybe get something like a wild salmon or eating something like a sardine. Um, and I still will get to the dairy thing, but I still would caution almost everyone to leave out the dairy unless it's um, from certain species of animals. We'll get to that in just a second. So those are a lot of pros of the ketogenic diet. P uh, ketogenic carnivore diet. People are um, lowering their fasting insulin. They're not relying on sugar. They seem to be very full. And because meat keeps you full for a very long time, you're eating a lot of fat, a lot of protein. People tend to automatically intermittent fast, which has uh, instant benefits to a lot of your inflammation signaling um, to your gut microbiome. So man, there's just a lot of benefits of potentially doing that. But let's look at some of the drawbacks. The first drawback is any diet that is incredibly restrictive. And the two uh, ends of this spectrum may be um, a carnivore and let's say a fruitarian, people who eat only fruits or eat only um, you know, animal products. And I say the fruitarian may be even uh, a little more limited than the carnivore because the carnivore still has a wider variety of different animals with diverse nutrient profiles versus fruit still kind of has the same amount of things like raised from fiber, some sugar, some vitamins, et cetera. But point being any restrictive diet um, is super tough because our bodies need a diver well, our not necessarily need, but there's a lot of benefits as we're going to talk about right now to getting a diverse range of foods into your body. And when you're super restrictive, one, it limits your behavioral options, which for better or for worse, for better, it's simpler to eat. You're like, when I go to the grocery store, I only buy bananas or I only buy, you know, X, Y, Z kind of protein. Um, but it does, you know, limit a lot of your choices and it might make it tough for you to really exist in your life by only having one particular thing forever. And when things are restrictive too, it acts on your psychology. We can't talk about nutrition without talking about psychology. And um, it acts on your psychology in such a way that you crave the things that are scarce. 
This is hardwired into human, um, you know, evolutionary biology. Things that are scarce, our body, our, 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 our mind starts to get hooked on them when we want more of them, right? What, what we lack um, is what we seek. Um, this is just kind of like a tourism. So maybe that might cause some problems with that particular diet. And I think that you can get a lot of the benefits in the middle ground with a wide variety of foods. But we also know when you do um, eat particular foods, it dynamically changes your gut microbiome. So unless you've been living under a rock for the last you know, year and a half in particular, but this conversation has really been going on for 15, 20 plus years, um, is the understanding that when we think of ourselves as human bodies and we maybe have 100 trillion cells, um, we have... We have so much bacteria. I'm not going to make up the number for you, but it's in the magnitude of billions, if not trillions of bacteria that line our entire digestive tract. And the foods we eat uh, dynamically interact with those bacteria and they influence our health um, for better or for worse. And we do want, we know from the research, although it's still like kind of like the wild, wild west, we're really learning this stuff. If there is a recommendation right now, it's probably a good idea to have a wider diversity of different types of bacteria and not just one particular species. And guess what? If you have a wide diversity, particularly um, the kind of bacteria that love to live on fiber, and we won't quite get down this rabbit hole yet, but like the fiber fermenting bacteria, aka the lactobacillus, the bifidobacterium, turn around the bottle of any probiotic you see in the top 10 of Amazon. It's going to have those two strains. We know they're good. These lactic acid producing bacteria that break down fiber and produce these short chain fatty acids, the butyrate, the stuff that's in butter that's very healing to our digestive tract, the stuff that Bulletproof Coffee really made popular, those are from the fiber-producing bacteria. But what happens if we're not eating fiber on a carnivore diet? Uh, we're only providing amino acids and fats, and there's a completely different species of bacteria that can ferment amino acids. So we get this shift from what uh, most humans probably normally have, which is fiber-containing bacteria, like fiber-fermenting bacteria, like Lactobacillus bifido. We know there's a lot of good health research on those helping a lot of different conditions. Um, to the putrefactive bacteria that are fermenting amino acids. Um, and this is a first key thing. We're limiting um, that gut bacteria strain. And we do know that you get a die off of some um, some certain species of bacteria in the, I think it's a phyla, but the Prevotella, um, not a phyla, a, 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 maybe a genus of a Prevotella bacteria that are good for helping improve sugar metabolism. So those die off when you're eating a carnivore diet, uh, which is, might not be a big deal. You could say, hey, Dr. A, what's the problem? I'm not eating sugar anyways. Totally good, fine. Um, but what happens if you ever switch your diet back? Well, maybe your gut bacteria might swing back. But point being, I don't know right now if I'd want to limit the strain of my gut bacteria, which means I want to eat a wider variety of foods to give them different kinds of fibers they have. And we also know that if there is a cancer that is um, directly linked to meat intake, it is colorectal cancer. Um, and this is because uh, when we get these putrefactive bacteria that ferment the amino acids in a very, very high meat diet, they kick off these secondary metabolites like putrescine um, and I think cadaverine. And basically these things damage the cells, the DNA of those cells that line the digestive tract, particularly in the colon. And when DNA is damaged and it starts to go on the replication process, what is that? That's cancer. That's how cancer starts. So if we have things that are directly putting uh, DNA damaging stress in the colon because we're having gut bacteria that are fermenting lots of meats in high quantities, that's not necessarily a good thing. And this also, as we have to shift back and forth this conversation between the food and the gut microbiome um, and the whole digestive tract anatomically, is we want to make sure that the food that we eat moves through the digestive tract at good speed. Um, a lot of the old school doctors, you know, I'm a naturopathic doctor. So we come from this kind of nature cure philosophy that using a lot of the things we're talking about now in functional medicine, but like food and movement and herbal supplements and getting the gut in check. The way they would really talk about disease back in the day, it was essentially a putrefaction, um, you know, basically like an endotoxemia thing where like stuff was sitting in the body, not moving and would produce toxins that would damage health. That was the concept of um, this nature cure medicine back in the 1700s. So what would they do with people? Well, they'd clean up their diets. They'd get them eating right. They'd fast them. They'd clean out this digestive tract. And that is incredibly valuable. Very helpful. In fact, I personally just got off a two-week juice feast of drinking only juices. And then I've reintroduced food sense. And again, we will talk about my diet because it's going to synthesize some of these um some of these concepts so far, uh, but point being the fasting and the resting of the GI tract is very important. But what happens when we have meat? Meat is the slowest thing to move through the body. It, you know, you could eat meat and it might be in your digestive tract for one, if not two, if not longer days, um, depending on how regular you normally are, depending on how many laxatives you have in your diet, depending on how much coffee you drink, but stuff sits there. 
We do not want stuff sitting in the body. We want to be regular. We want to be moving stuff through. This is why when you go to a doctor's office, you come in, I give you a checkup, for example. Um, we're looking how, like the quality of your stool, how many bowel movements you have in a day. Is there any straining? Uh, what's the size of it? Is there any blood in it? The stuff that we're getting out of our bodies tells us so much about the health of, of our digestion. So start paying attention to your poop. It's giving you a lot of good data. But the point is, I worry about the carnivore diet. I do worry about stuff not moving through the track as much. I do worry about more pressure um, on those enterocytes from these secondary metabolites from the amino acid fermentation of eating the carnivore diet. And if that's going to increase risk of colon cancer. But look, there also are a lot of, uh, you know, a carnivore diet does upregulate glutathione. Uh, our own internal antioxidant production because it's providing some of the key amino acids for doing that. So it's like, do I know if it's actually going to happen? Like carnivore diet equals going, heck no, we can't say that, but we can speculate about potential concerns. Two more concerns on carnivore diet. Then we're going to shift our focus um, to, you know, the, the plant-based vegan vegetarian and maybe where we might find ourselves at the end in the middle of this conversation. But another thing is we can't just look at nutrition in terms of like what the food is in macronutrients on paper of steak per se. We have to look at what the heating and the cooking process does to that um, in general. It is so overlooked and it's very frustrating. <sighs> okay, we're into it. So essentially when we heat foods, whether they're carbohydrates or they're proteins, it kicks off different kinds of compounds. Heat, heat creates chemistry in these, uh, in these food sources. So when we get that char on a steak, those are denatured uh, amino acids and proteins. And guess what they're called? Polyaromatic hydrocarbons, PAHs, or heterocyclic amines, or HCAs, or I'm sure there's other abbreviations that I don't know. But point being is these things are cancerous. Um, they are also inducers of the liver and different metabolism of different drugs and enzymes and stuff like or, Yeah, you get the idea. They do a lot of things to the body. They are linked to cancer. So I would say if I was doing a carnivore diet, I would not be charring the heck out of my steaks. I think that is a bad idea. Um, um, and I would do something maybe like sous vide, lower temperature, no char. Uh, that's something that needs to be taken into account. Um, you know, also when you're combusting fats and when you're eating fatty meats and you're combusting those fats, it creates dioxins, which are other chemicals that might lead to more lipid peroxidation, which uh, could go down the rabbit hole of having more heart disease risk. These are things. So the heat in which we cook things needs to be taken into account. Quite frankly, if you had a dehydrator and you could dehydrate salmon jerky or dehydrate grass-fed beef, that'd probably be the best option you can avoid these potential issues. Also, there are some native compounds in meats like NEU5GC, which I believe is like a, a sugar-based molecule that's in meat, um, particularly in beef, um, that activates our immune system and causes our immune system to get a little stimulated. There's also the issue of potentially the choline in eggs, uh, you know, creating more TMAO, which is linked, although not causative, to heart disease. So, yeah, we can pick out some things here and potentially those might be issues. They're definitely on the table, but we don't know because we don't have enough long term data about how carnivore is. We have a lot of anecdotal data um, if those things are going to play out because those issues, if they do exist, um, you know, on the dioxins, on the polyaromatic hydrocarbons, um, you know, on the TMAO, they're not going to be things we really see and show up in terms of health problems for people for another like 5, 10, 15 years, whereas the timeline of creating some of these potential cancer emergencies um, or heart disease. And please understand, I'm not saying that's going to happen. I'm just saying we have to keep it on the possibility of discussion when looking at some of these issues. And if you are worried about the NEU5GC stimulating your immune system, I believe that bison does not have... Uh, the same issues as grass-fed beef. And listen, as I'm talking about this stuff, um, I'm not condoning any of the particular practices of this. I'm just talking on a nutritional basis about what you may consider doing. Now, to talk about, before we make the shift over to plant-based, I want to quickly discuss ketogenic as a whole, then we'll make a pause point, then we'll come over to the plant-based side of the equation, and then we'll kind of figure out what's the Frankenstein, you know, nutrition approach that I believe we should base our current actions on based on the available data. So ketogenic, essentially what this is, and I'm sure you know by now, you've heard about the mechanisms, when we do not give the body carbohydrate um, in the form of whether it's the fruits or the longer starches, no glucose, the brain needs energy to run. So if it's not running on glucose, which is a preferred fuel, it can kick off. Um, it can work with the liver to turn fat into these things called ketone bodies to fuel your brain and run your metabolism. And then you truly are fat adapted. Uh, your enzymatic machinery inside your mitochondria starts to shift and your body gets better at burning fat. And I want to say this. Um, this is very, very, very important because people conflate the idea of burning fat with fat burning, aka you're losing body fat. Um, yes, they're related, but they're not the same thing. 
you could never, you could essentially eat a super high carbohydrate diet, like 80% carbs, 10 protein, um, 10 fat, and still burn a ton of fat if you're eating fewer calories and you're expending per day. 3,000 metabolic expenditure, 2,500 intake, you're burning fat, particularly at rest, even in the presence of carbs and insulin, your body's still doing this. Energy matters. Um, and vice versa, you know, it, you'd have to actually try because some of these high fat foods keep you so uh, satiated, but you could gain weight on a ketogenic diet, right? You know, if I force fed you meats and lots of oils and lots of butters and you burn 2,500 calories per day, but we fed you 3,500 in the form of fat, yes, your body would be burning fat for energy throughout your day, but you'd also be storing those excess calories because you're not using them. And fat is very easily stored in fat cells. That's why they're called fat cells. Um, and so you can very easily store that fat. Your body's good at it. And it also gets good at releasing it and burning it. So this is this ketogenic thing. And again, what are some of the benefits? Well, most of the problematic foods in our diets are those shitty carb containing foods, the processed things, most things that come in a box that have carbohydrates, particularly all the wheats, a lot of these low quality snacks, the fruit juices, the sugars, none of that's in keto. So what do people start to eat? They start to eat cleaner foods. They're probably eating more wild fish. They're probably eating more avocados, which are great for you. Probably, uh, you know, uh, maybe some nuts like macadamia nuts depends on how low you are in getting on the carbohydrates, but people make better food choices. Um, and people also tend to start to intermittent fast because the fat keeps you full longer and they're not eating as much. They're not having these carb cycle addiction things. So there's a lot of benefits to going keto. Again, I will say any diet that is incredibly restrictive does leave some things off the table. So your keto, for example, and you're very strict and religious to keto, doesn't it kind of stink a little bit that you can't necessarily have something healthy for you like organic blueberries or organic raspberries that have a lot of amazing compounds? And yes, they may spike your blood sugar a little bit and they're not strictly keto, but they'd be more beneficial to have in your diet than not. And once you've corrected your glucose metabolism and your insulin signaling on ketogenic diets, it doesn't mean that the only way to maintain your insulin signaling and your, uh, your low HbA1c is by staying keto. So are you throwing the baby out with the bathwater a little bit? Potentially, I guess it's for you to decide, but if you find that you do love uh, these ketogenic diets and the foods work with your palate and work with your family and your lifestyle and all the sex, then cool. I would say the same cautions with the carnivore diet still do exist. Food quality, not necessarily combusting your animal meats at high, thi at high temperatures. Um, and look, saturated fat, we do know, um, does raise cholesterol levels. That does not mean you will get heart disease. The whole old story of like saturated fat um, and uh, like cholesterol is equals heart attacks is just not true. But we do know that saturated fat does raise total LDL cholesterol. And we can get into the science of LDLs. There's a lot of good stuff online. But point being, don't necessarily worry just about the LDL level. It's the amount of oxidized LDL. It's the amount of LDL that's been affected um, by an immune system that's reactive. And there's a whole relationship between what happens in the digestive tract and why the LDL oxidized happens. But just having strictly high LDL may not be a problem if it's not in the presence of inflammation. So these normal blood work panels with the HDL, the LDL, the VLDL totals um, aren't enough. We need to be looking at the particle size and the density of those LDLs. How many of those LDLs are oxidized into foam cells? Uh, there's lots of good blood panels you can ask your doctor for, like Cardio IQ um, is one that comes to the top of my mind, but we gotta look at these fractionated stuff and look deeper. It's not as simple as saying, you know, saturated fat in your carnivore diet or your keto diet is gonna raise your cholesterol and that's gonna cause heart disease. It's, it's, it's LDL that's oxidized in the presence of, you know, inflammatory stuff, whether it's from the immune system or, or the gut or otherwise, largely mediated by the immune system. So keto diets can be fine. I think they can be over restrictive, but I think they're highly, highly um, healing for people, especially if you've been addicted to carb containing foods and you're trying to reset your body, keto can be great. So we're going to take a pause here. Um, I believe we're almost at 30 minutes and this has kind of turned into a one man rant podcast, but hey, I hope you're getting some value from this. Literally, the majority of these paragraphs that I'm speaking could probably have a video topic on it in general. So if you're finding things in this first video that you're like, hey, Dr. A, I would love to learn more about this, explain this little bit of the puzzle more, amazing. Because the purpose of this conversation is to paint the puzzle for you. What are the pieces that we know we have on the table right now in this nutrition discussion? How do we think they fit? And if we're not sure, let's just say that and not pretend like we know. And then how are different people, um, you know, creating camps in this whole map that we're creating? So that's the pause here. We covered a lot of carnivore, a lot of keto. What we're going to do is shift over to the other side of the equation and talk about um, the other extreme, plant-based diets, vegan, vegetarian diets next, and what they think they're doing right, what the research actually shows, 
And then we'll wrap this all up and I'll tell you more about my personal diet and what I do to keep my family healthy um, and a lot of our members over at the Fit Father Project and the Fit Mother Project. So I hope you enjoy this. I hope someone actually watched this. Um, <laughs> I had fun ranting and I'll talk to you in the next installment of this video.